Hello and welcome to the John Ark Show. Today we're going to interview legendary horror movie actor Michael Berryman. Michael has appeared in countless horror movies, classics such as The Hills Have Eyes, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Weird Science, The Devil's Rejects, and many, many others. Before we uh, begin, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel for free. You can also like, comment, and follow us. We're going to have a lot of great celebrity interviews coming up, so make sure to click on that notification bell so you can be notified every time we upload a new episode. Also, we ask that you post a link to today's show on all your social media to help spread the word. Now, let's say hello to Michael Berryman. Hello, Michael. Welcome to the John Ark Show. How are you today? I'm doing very well. I uh, woke up and I found a pulse, and uh, so that's a good start. That's a lottery <laughs> lottery ticket buying day. <laughs> exactly. So, Michael, as a legendary horror movie actor, you've appeared in countless great movies, uh, movies that most horror fans believe are some of the best ever made. But when people meet you in person, uh, are they often surprised at how different your behavior is from the characters you portray in the movies? Uh, fans often describe you as intelligent, dignified, kind in person. Uh, to what do you attribute your, your great and highly civilized personality? Excellent question. Uh, well, the answer is pretty straightforward. Uh, obviously, uh, my, my parents and my, uh, my, my grandparents, especially Sophie, um, she was one of my mentors. I think it comes down to, well, for those that are not aware, my, my father was a Marine uh, brain surgeon, neurologist, and he went to Ground Zero at Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So he came back, when he came back home, I was the second born, and of course he was radiated, and that's why I had the birth defects. I would say is something that my fans uh, know uh, and they appreciate in the conversations that we have had, uh, meeting and greeting them at conventions and then on the street in general and public for over 40 years. So, um, when uh, when people talk about me, there's a difference between the actor and the role portrayed. It might be sinister or scary or futuristic or whatever, but they know that is not the man. Um, people accept you for who you really are. Right, right. Tell us about the day you were discovered and given your first film role. Well, I was discovered in Los Angeles. Uh, there's a little city called Venice. And I grew up in Santa Monica. Uh, Venice Beach is, uh, well, they had a pier, and then there was the Santa Monica Pier, and I, I grew up and in, in, in visiting those areas. And when I came, came back home to Santa Monica after being at the, uh, my university, I, um, I met a gentleman by the name of George Powell. He was uh, visiting his, uh, his uh, daughter and son-in-law at an antique store on West Washington Boulevard, in Venice Beach. And we had, um, a friend of mine and I had a little gift shop across the street and we got invited over to a, a meet and greet and they had a lot of antiquities. Uh, and so they had a, uh, uh, a special sale invitation only. So a lot, a lot of, a lot of big wigs, you know, big high rollers were there, people with, uh, with means there because they had antiquities from, uh, from Egypt, etc. That being said, the the woman who was uh, was co-owner with her husband, her father was George Powell. So I didn't know who I knew who George was, but I did not recognize the man. So he came up to me and he's, and, and I was I was wearing a black um, cape that I had purchased from one of our uh, neighbors uh, uh, on on the street there, and it was from Morocco. And it was beautiful. It had a hood and everything. And, and uh, so we thought we would dress up, you know, pretty uh, uh, highfalutin, so to speak. And he goes, oh, pardon me, uh, are you an actor? You know, I go, and I go, oh, the, the robe might be <laughs> uh, persuading you to that conclusion. But, but no, no, uh, I, I own that little gift shop across the street with my friend over there. He goes, oh. He says, and, and he put up his hands and did this, which is, you know, framing. And he goes, um, you have an interesting face. And I, I, I laughed and I said, well, I, oh gosh, I've never heard that before, uh, jokingly. And he said, well, honestly, here, um, I, I want you to be in my movie. And I go, what? I says, uh, what are you talking about? And he handed me his business card and, and I looked at it and said, George Powell. 
And then I, I put the two and two together and I said, do you know who you are? You're, you, you, you created uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth, The Time Machine, uh, War of the Worlds. Uh, I, I love the films that you make. And he said, patted my hand and he said, look, uh, I'm doing a movie called Doc Savage. And I goes, oh, those based on those uh, pulp, pulp novels. And I go, who's playing Doc Savage? And he goes, oh, Ron Ely. And I go, oh, the blonde Tarzan. Okay, cool. And I said, well, uh, I'm not an actor. I haven't had any experience in that. And I, he says, well, I will give you a Taft Hartley contract where you'll get a two day guarantee on day, and on day two, I will uh, send a letter to the Screen Actors Guild and that's how you get in and I'll pay your, your startup fee, which was I think $200. Uh, $200. Um, and I said, well, thank you. So I figured, wow, this is, this is cool. So sure enough, a script was mailed to my, uh, the house I was living in. And I went to Warner Brothers and I did the, the wardrobe outfit and went to Harold Lloyd's estate is where we filmed the, the episode I was in, my scenes. And everything went pretty darn well. And it was kind of fun. And then I went home and I got the check in the mail about a week later. And I figured that was a very quick career. And um, I was getting prepared to move to Alaska. I wanted to homestead and live out in God's country, so to speak. I love the woods. I love nature. And before I had a chance to do that, I received a telephone call. And the telephone call was from Michael Fenton and Jane Feinberg, who were very... Uh, respected casting directors in, in, in uh, Hollywood. And they were casting for another project called One Flew Over to Cuckoo's Nest. So um, they called me up and they said, would you like, would you please come to this um, address and uh, meet Milos Forman and uh, Saul Zantz and uh, we're doing a movie uh, with Jack Nicholson. And I go, mm, yeah, sure, I'll go. And I went and they hired me uh, to be in Cuckoo's Nest, and that got everything started. You know, when I was a kid, I was an usher in a movie theater. And one summer, this is back when movie theaters only had one big screen for one movie, which they showed all day and all night. And so one summer day, they got a movie called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And do you know which scene in the movie got the largest round of applause every time they showed it? It was you appearing on screen. And uh, people just love that facial expression of yours. And they love the movie. So I, I could see why it was so impactful. So um, did you, how, by the way, how old were you when they offered you uh, your first movie? I think I was around 23. Okay. All right. Right around 23 years old. So did you, did you have some long conversations with Nicholson? Did you meet him? Did you guys hit it off or not really? Oh, uh, we, uh, I spent 127 days uh, in Salem, Oregon. We filmed at Oregon State Hospital. We had two weeks of rehearsals with camera, and uh, we, we worked uh, six days a week, to 10 to 12 hours a day. So did you hit it off with Jack, or was Jack busy doing his own thing? Jack was wonderful. I remember, um, wow, like I said, uh, I was 127 days. So we, we all got to know everybody. We were, we, were, uh, we, the actors, were staying at the Holiday Inn. Uh, Jack Nicholson and Louise Fletcher were, uh, um, were staying uh, um, at a house that the production uh, producers, Michael Douglas and the rest, uh, rented a big, large house, and they were staying there. But uh, every day, we, we were, you know, we, were, we bumped elbows, uh, like I said, six days a week, uh, 10, 12 hours a day. So we got to know each other. Every, we became one big family. How about Danny DeVito? Didn't he have a great sense of humor? Dan, Danny is awesome. I remember at, at the at the hospital that was our we had one whole building to ourselves, and uh, there was a room that had a pool table. And you know, Danny's not super tall, but if he stretches on his tiptoes, he can he can run the table. He's a good pool player. But you no, know, we we all I would say that over time, as the weeks turn into months, everybody was uh, revealed to one another. And what I mean by that is e uh, emotionally and mentally, um, because of the, of the roles we were playing, and especially being in that environment, everybody's insecurity and everybody's strength and everything in between 
rose to, uh, percolated to the surface. Because uh, as an actor slash artist, when you're portraying a character, you have to have the, you have to crawl inside of yourself and, and create the character. And you have to uh, see things and respond and say your lines and interact in, in, with your fellow actors in scenes through the character's eyes. Now, did, so, did any of the patients there recognize Nicholson or you or DeVito, or they were just not aware? No, not, not at all, because number one, uh, none, of, none of us, Danny, even the chief and myself, we were not well known. This was my second job. Okay. Uh, and, and none of them really, there was no star, ooh, ah, look who we're working with. Uh, no, the only thing that impressed them uh, to that in that manner would be the fact that there was a film company were the local people that would show up at the holiday Inn at the bar because uh, <laughs> got to understand uh, Salem is a, is a quiet little town. So at sundown, there's a few restaurants that are open. By the time we wrapped for, for, for the day, sometimes we shot all nights. There was a black Angus restaurant and then there was the, the restaurant at the hotel. It was, a, it was a great movie. It was a masterpiece. It really was. Now, you we also worked on The X-Files. That was really an intelligent oh, yeah. produced uh, TV show. How did you like that? Well, I was a big fan of the show, number one. And when I got the script from, from my agent, and I had an appointment to go read to uh, Chris Carter and uh, David Nutter, our director, I had had some previous experience in my, in my, uh, in my own life uh, that dealt with uh, a mother and a uh, a uh, child and safety and Mr. Not Wonderful and how do you keep them from uh, harm and if you, and over time um, I had I did the best I could to try to help the situation and um, there's some uh, the ending was was sad everybody lived but there was some damage. You used to live on a farm or you still live on a farm. Well, we're in the country. Our, our neighbors, we can hunt in our backyard uh, for deer. There's a lot of lot of deer out in this area. There's a huge lake just up the road. Uh, I, I, I used to live in the mountains at 7,000 feet uh, east of Los Angeles. There's an area called Big Bear. Um, uh, I've been to Wyoming and Montana. And, um, so what took you out to the Midwest? Uh, because that's quite a stark contrast from living in Los Angeles. See... In 1966, I left Santa Monica and I went to San Luis Obispo, which was 200 miles north. And then um, I only came back to L.A. in 1972, just for a short time. That's where I met George Powell. But I've always preferred to live out in the country. I love nature. I used to be a scuba diver. Uh, uh, good Lord, I, I've been to the Amazon. I've been to Guyana. Um, there's some very, I have a very, uh, very special connection with um, the natural world, so to speak. I actually got to spend the day. Um, we were uh, scuba diving, and at the end of our dive, my partner and I were uh, body surfing, and it was foggy at the beach near, uh, just above Nat Malibu and near the Ventura County line. And I'm catching a wave. And I look down, I, I see a body. I think it's my, my buddy, but no, it was an otter on its back, cutting below the wave underneath me and looking up and almost, almost waving. I go, hey, this is kind of fun. I spent about 45 minutes with a family of six, six to eight otters uh, catching waves and body surfing. And, and then it was so foggy, you couldn't even see the, the, the oh, coastline. So, now, do you think the otter that waved at you recognized you from one of your movies? Oh, of course. <laughs> Without a doubt. <laughs> so now you've had a long and successful marriage. How did you and your wife meet? And what has been the secret to the longevity of your marriage? Um, there was a little place uh, called Ch uh, Charlie Brown's. If you go to Palmdale, which is where they build everything that doesn't exist, the Skunk Works, Black Ops, Lockheed, etc. And, and, and I got to meet a lot of people that uh, were air traffic controllers and people that worked on reverse engineering in area 51, 52, 53, the places that don't exist. And we would only have a conversation at my friend's uh, uh, diner when it was just us locals. And then Larry would pull out a bottle of some 
really good scotch. Scotch tastes like gasoline unless you're spending three or four hundred bucks a bottle. You're getting the good stuff, and and they would just tell stories. And I can't share with you over over the air what they were, but uh, just use your imagination. So um, up the road in a little place called Little Rock, um, I rented a little a uh, little house that was surrounded by twenty acres of, of peaches. It was wonderful. It was heavenly. My dog and I, we, we would go out and just walk around in, in, in the a forest of peach trees. And there'd be, you know, hundreds and hundreds of quail, wildlife, etc. And then up the road, about a, a quarter of a mile away, was this little a little place called Charlie Brown's. That's where Ronald Reagan would get his jelly beans. And they had a, a wine tasting room. And that's where I met my wife. I, 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 was, I was waiting for my next unemployment check. Actually, I had about a few, just a few bucks in the bank waiting for my next interview or work. And, and I was hoping that my unemployment check would show up sooner, but it, it, it was a few days later. And I think I had, honestly, I think I had like $4 in my pocket. And for th- that's how you know she loved you. That's how you know. <laughs> so I, you get a little, little poor, you know, you, you can get three different tastes uh, uh, for a couple, for a buck a piece at dinner. And uh, I'm curious, what was her, zo- what was her zodiac sign and what is your zodiac sign? Uh, I'm a Virgo. She's a a Libra. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So now you've been in countless great movies and TV shows. What happens around Halloween when the kids ring your doorbell for candy and Michael Berriman opens (laughs) the door? What do they do? What do they say? Well, uh, when that did happen, because I've always lived in more remote areas, um, they w- they wouldn't really recognize me. Once I got to the point where being an icon of horror, so to speak, after Hills Have Eyes, let's say, um, uh, never really. We, I've always kind of lived where there weren't a lot of trick or treaters. Uh, I I, I, uh, um, I like to have a lot of acreage around. I always have dogs. So uh, I've never had uh, that as a situation, but at, uh, at hotels, at conventions, uh, or occasionally um, you know, at a, on the street or at a store, somebody will mention. And then um, I will just ask them, well, what do you remember me from? And then we'll go right away into a conversation of what that particular uh, role was like. Uh, I've had people say, uh, you know, do you still eat babies? And I go, no. No, that was that was acting, <laughs> and uh, that, that wasn't me. That was Papa Chup, you know. <laughs> so you just kind of commit and have fun with them, you know. Basically, people like to get scared. What do you think of the horror movies being made these days, as compared to the stuff that was made in the eighties or nineties? Do you like it more? Do you like it less? What are your What are your thoughts? Um, I I try to go to a lot of, uh, as many independent film festivals as I possibly can because the writing and the uh, fresh approach to um, horror is 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 it's fresh it's different it's not the same old you can expect what to happen next I I've been watching uh, I think on Amazon. Uh, uh, or maybe it's in this Netflix. It's called um, uh, Strange, Stranger Things, I think it's called. Uh, good writing. Um, there's a lot of really excellent uh, uh, horror stuff out there. Most of it, I think, uh, you'll find in the uh, independent uh, yeah. of, uh, film projects. Um, there are people uh, starting out making their mark. Um, uh, some of the other ones are they're not universal classics they're, you can kind of almost guess what the next scene is going to be yeah. so the, I think the big studios need to go back to the basics of storytelling by the way I was watching a clips from the original uh, Frankenstein movie uh, months ago and I interviewed his sister Sarah Karloff I, I know Sarah very well yeah what a dignified and graceful and intelligent woman and then when I watched some of the old Boris Karloff black and white interviews on various shows, same thing there. Very intelligent, very dignified. So then I went, I looked at some of the key clips from his Frankenstein movie, and you can see it again. The same dignity, the same intelligence in his movements, you know, and, uh, and I, I, I now understand the, the success of his career. You know, it's very rarely that you see dignified monsters out there. You just don't see that very often let alone intelligent monsters. That's very true. I, uh, I remember having dinner with Sarah. She was, uh, we were doing a convention uh, 
I think it was in Los Angeles years and years ago. And she had pictures of uh, Bella and uh, um, um, the gentleman who played the Wolfman um, and her father and pictures of her sitting on her father's knee and, she, and how, what it was like when she was a child. And you know, these uh, wonderful, uh, talented uh, gentlemen would come over to the house and she would just hang with them and they were just lovely. Um, most of the people that are at that level in, in, in horror, and I'll say in a classic sense, are some of the kindest, most um, thought-provoking and humanity-rising types of individuals that I have ever met. Uh, Sid Haig, uh, my dear friend, we, we lost him a while back, but uh, he, he, he was from that uh, um, that cut, so to speak, that fabric, that fabric of, of the, the threads of uh, uh, humanity, or your, your personal uh, uh, expression and how you see things and how you relate to the story and how you, uh, how you climb inside the character. I, I like to start with the, the bones and then just add the flesh to it. There are nuanced moments in, in Frankenstein uh, where it, it's just a, a a slight look and a slight, you know, uh, expression, or, or just a little bit of body movement. Uh, uh, it, you don't have to blast it out there. Um, uh, it turns into a, a, a video game. Uh, I, I like character development. So, uh, Michael, um, Michael, who treats you more respectfully these days uh, in public? Is it your horror movie fans, or is it complete strangers like that you may see at a store or elsewhere? Well, that, that's a, that's an interesting question. I, I would have to say um, it's well-rounded uh, people because uh, I, I've done many podcasts and many lectures and, and met thousands of people at shows. And what people appreciate the most is that I can create a character that's not me as as, as Michael Berryman, and they appreciate the uh, uh, the difference. But they'll always say. Uh, he's just such a nice guy. Well, um, I, I am. Uh, I believe the world, uh, I believe our time here is, is should be spent to make the world a little better place. Um, Do you come however, from your religious background or are you just naturally easygoing? And, and a uh, I'm, I'm not a big fan of organized religion, so to speak. Well, actually uh, not. Um, I actually got thrown out of the Vatican when I was working in Rome. I'm proud of that. Uh, I'm going to do a little uh, video. Uh, this is a book I wrote. It's Barnes & Noble published it. It's available through Amazon. It's called It's All Good. That's my father. That's my sister. That's me. Now, it's a memoir. It's about a, a young boy who had a different type of a life and, and his relationship with his family and the world and ethics, humanity. Those are very important principles. I learned a lot of them in Catholic school. I also saw a lot of inappropriate in Catholic school. My father was a Presbyterian. He was the top neurologist and brain surgeon in the entire Western Hemisphere. He was Muhammad Ali's neurologist. That's in my memoir, I mentioned, I opened the front door to my house in Santa Monica on three occasions, and there was men in black suits with wires behind their ears, the Secret Service. Three times they showed up. My father went with them, kissed my mom on her cheek, he had his black bag and they put my dad in the black Lincoln town car and they drove him away. And then he came home later. The first time was, uh, well, Bobby and John Kennedy. Hmm. The third time, Marilyn Monroe. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Did and in my book, I, I explain how she was killed, how she was murdered. My father made me promise not to share that information until after he passed. She was that, is that something you can discuss now or no? I can discuss it right now. It's in my book. I tell you exactly how she was killed. Please do. Please do. Marilyn Monroe was given a barbiturate enema. That's what I heard. And my, my father examined her and found that to be the case. Mm. Yes, sir. Uh, how, how long after she passed did he examine her? Um, when they found her um, unconscious, uh, uh, they came to the house immediately and off my father went. Same day. Interesting. Have you seen the death photos of Marilyn at her house? Yes. She's laying on the bed. It's really, the, dis the discoloration, it's, it's disturbing. 
you know? Well, the body, the body does morph in a certain manner, but also that was a, in my opinion, uh, that I believe that was a posed shot. Did you Bottom see, uh, you know, Marilyn spent a long, long time looking for her home. And then when she found it, did you see the plaque that was on the home before she bought it? But she saw it there. And that was one of the reasons she purchased it. Have you ever seen that fla that plaque online? It says, I, and here, I believe, I believe it says, and here my search ends. Interesting. Really interesting house. Very there's, interesting. Also, there's also a video of Marilyn's house. Um, and uh, there's this mother-daughter team. Uh, the mother is a realtor, and they, they, they somehow snuck onto the property. And, you know, with their, they're there with their GoPros or the cameras or whatever, and they're walking around looking through the windows. I don't know if you're a big Maryland fan or not, but I was marveling at the scale of the interior of the house. You know, the ceilings were a little lower than they are today. The fireplace is a little smaller than things are today. And uh, it was just very, very interesting to see. Um, but, you know, what you mentioned about your father's. Uh, so any other diagnosis or observations that your father made of, of Maryland, Maryland's situation? No, that was a specific um, that ended her life. I mean, I mean he, uh, what I told you is a, a verbatim of what he told me. I, I've interviewed and, a number of mobsters, and that's the story they give as well. Interesting. Uh, there is also, um, well, uh, I'm, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the rumor was in, in our town of Santa Monica that uh, she had a daughter. Yeah. And she rented a little uh, studio uh, duplex uh, on Montana Boulevard and 21st Street, right next to Henry's Market. She went to Samo High. I don't know her name. I, if I knew it, I wouldn't say it anyway. And everybody in Santa Monica knew who she was. She was pretty much a recluse. She would walk just across this little street to do her shopping, and she and then she'd go to uh, she went to you know, went to high school uh, in Santa Monica, uh, where uh, it's not important. And she was a dead ringer for her mother. Is and, she still alive? Uh, I have no idea. I have no idea. All I know is I used to see her on occasion. She went to school with one of the classes uh, uh, um, of one of my brothers, uh, one of my three brothers. But uh, everybody in, in Santa Monica, uh, people knew, people showed respect. Nobody bugged her. Uh, they uh, let her have her privacy, which I, I, I found to be uh, endearing and respectful. How old do you think she would be today? Is she still alive? I have no idea. If you had to guess, how old do you think she was? Well, um, she was going to be about 1966. She was probably 15, 16. Well, it was around 1964. Is what, uh, but the, that's about the time when she was in high school. Interesting. Um, so you could do the math from that. That's right. as close as I can uh, guess. So, so uh, as everybody can see, life in L.A. is deteriorating quickly with the crime and the homelessness. <laughs> and the drugs. We, I don't know how long it's been since you've been in LA, but when you are in LA and you look around, especially with the, the homeless encampments under every freeway overpass. Every freeway overpass. Do you ever look and say, you know, LA now looks worse than a lot of the horror movies I've been in. Do, do you ever get that impression or is that too much of an exaggeration, too much of a leap? Well, it's not an exaggeration. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say horror movie, I mean, Night of the Living Dead or something. I would say more of the uh, um, horrific decisions made by public officials that allowed that to become the case. Now, I remember when Ronald Reagan said anybody that had not been arrested or uh, uh, been um, designated by the courts to be in a state hospital is free to go. They became our first homeless. I understand that uh, Ronald Reagan had a degree in economics, so maybe he was just crunching the numbers. But you know, you know, maybe maybe I can't read his mind, but it appeared to me that he was just just trying to save some money on some people that who who would care. Now, uh, you were in a movie called Weird Science, uh, starring an actress uh, I know called Kelly LeBrock, um, and she was a very very striking woman. Uh, how did uh, she interact with you and the other people on the set? Because I, I don't know if she was married to uh, Steven Seagal at that time or not, but uh, how was it to work with her? Do you have any uh, recollections of that? 
I have a lot of recollections from weird science. Uh, number one, uh, uh, I'll answer your question straight up. Uh, she was delightful. She was uh, on, on the mark. She was present. She was not. She didn't run off to a trailer between takes. She was absolutely delightful. Um, Robert Downey Jr., uh, we all knew at that time, a genius, absolute super talent. The uh, Wyatt, I, I saw Wyatt actually became a school teacher. Uh, uh, I saw him uh, at a convention not too long ago. I got pictures of him and then Hilly, the, the blonde girlfriend, and then the brunette, uh, uh, her. And then, uh, of course, uh, uh, Michael Anthony Hall. He's a producer now. He's all filled out. You know, he looks good in this nice suit, you know. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Bill Paxton. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful guy. The last I remember talking to, to Bill, uh, Bill Paxton, I said, you're my favorite whiner. And those teeth, he goes, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, uh, aliens, game over, man. That's, it. That's the line. That is the That's line. That's the line. <laughs> and um, I mean, what, what a smile. I mean, Vernon Wells, I, I keep in touch with Vernon. We, we still do conventions together. Uh, I remember when he, he met his wife and uh, uh, we were we were all, all together. And it's just, you make friends forever. And I can also have eyes. Uh, Susan Lanier is still in touch with her. She's just wonderful. Uh, Janice Blythe, who played Ruby. Um, w when you when you do a film project, uh, you interact with people, and uh, sometimes you make really really solid connections, and it's uh, um, you can't put a price on that. You really can't. So, given where uh, all the horror movies are now and the direction they're going in, it's very very extreme. You know, the the Purge movies and the Saw movies. Based on all that, where do you think horror movies will be in five to eight years? Can you imagine them getting any more extreme? No, I, I think that they've run the gamut. Um, I, I've met a lot, and I know some of the people that make the, the they, they push the envelope because they, they're trying to compete against uh, uh, streaming. And there's so many uh, venues now for content and they want to make a name for themselves. So. Um, I, I remember when, when Wes Craven was, well, he did Last House on the Left. I mean, that's a rough, I mean, David, David Hess was a very dear friend of mine. That's a, that's a tough movie. Um, so if you do something outlandish and people go, oh, wow, what's this guy doing? Uh, okay, now you've created some awareness. What are you going to do? What are you going to follow up with? I'm not a big fan of, of the Saw movies. Uh, there, are, there are certain films that I would call torture porn. And, and it's just not my ball of wax. I have turned down roles where they wanted me to behave in a certain manner as the, as the, uh, the threat, you know, the bad guy. And I go, I won't do that. So uh, we researched your career and found out that you're extremely popular at the conventions. And in fact, um, we've seen you at some conventions or you know, some people I know have seen you at some conventions and they've noticed that you get longer lines than a lot of these stunningly beautiful uh, actresses who've been in some well-known movies. What do you what do you attribute that to? Do you think people just love horror more than they love beautiful women? Is that what's going on? It's uh, it's neither neither of those. Huh? What it is is I make a personal connection with every single person that comes to my table. Now, for instance, if there's just a, a few people, I will chat it up. Um, and, and the manner of the conversation, the conversation is usually started with, with the, uh, the guest, I'll say. And though I have some questions, and then uh, I'm very observant. Uh, I used to do a lot of uh, uh, security work. I, I was, did some uh, security for a couple of years at Bob Dylan's home, for instance. My point is you make a personal connection with each person. Now, there are people, if you go to horror conventions, they're different than than other types of conventions. And here's what I mean. You can see people with severe handicaps, either birth defects or they're gimpy or they're, they stutter or it could, be a, it could be visual, it could be mental, you never know. And then there, of course there's a lot of people in, in costumes and, and, uh, and such, but nobody, I've never ever, ever, seen a child or someone point a finger and go, ew, look at that person, ew. There is no taunting, no teasing. There is total acceptance. Now, some of the people that you see at a core convention 
could be in costume and you wonder, because uh, I've had hotel guests come in and go, what's going on? Well, here, I'll get you a pass. Come on in, take a look around. Oh, there's a comic book I had as a kid. There's a movie I like. Oh, there's some nice, you know, uh, 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 product. Uh, that's an interesting sculpture. And, and they go, wow, the people here seem to be normal. I go, they're very normal. And that super nice. Great. They're super nice. I've they're never heard anybody nice. utter a bad word at a convention, unlike Ever. football games or soccer games. Where some people go crazy, you know. Sports uh, can, can be that way. Uh, now, the education level. I used to, some of these people are doctors and nurses and scientists and, and research people and you name it. Uh, uh, I mean, you'd be surprised. I used to say, if you show me a library card, I'll give you a free autograph picture. I, I stopped doing that decades ago because these people are readers. They're some very, very intelligent, educated people. But why did they go? It's a it's a family experience. The whole family can enjoy it and have a good time. So, do you ever run into any of the people from high school or your early days in life who may have perhaps mistreated you, or uh, or people who you have asked out or dated who treated you poorly? And did you ever bump into them later in life after you became a well known celebrity? And did their treatment of you change at that point? That's a very uh, excellent question. Uh, and, and the answer is, is, is kind of a no. However, um, I have friends that I've known since grammar school. And, you know, the, as the career grew, of course, it became like, well, can you believe this actually happened? Well, it only happens serendipitously. And in my memoir, yeah, I'll put it up again. It's all good. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, thank you. Check it out. Then there I describe my life as a child and having a difference and being teased and getting in fights and, 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 and well, I'll just be straight up. Uh, Catholic school was not fun uh, uh, at a particular juncture. But I'm a very straight up, I'll tell it to you straight kind of guy. And um, I don't make anything up. I tell it exactly how it came down. But yeah, I, I interviewed an SR, I don't know if you're familiar with aeronautics, but I interviewed an SR-71 Blackbird pilot. Oh, I, 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 I used to, I rented a house right at the end of the runway in Palmdale. I used to see stuff that didn't exist fly over my house every day. I love that plane. I love, oh, that plane is, yeah. I've met the engineers. Uh, my, my uncle, uh, uh, Jerome Oppenheim, designed the honeycomb structure of the leading edge of the X-15 for heat dispersion. Yeah, they have a... Uh, an SR-71 on display here at the Smithsonian here outside of Washington and, and, you know, at the Dulles Airport. And they also have a space shuttle there. And the SR-71 looks way cooler than the space shuttle. It's so cool. And I, I've talked to pilots and I go, uh, will it do Mach 7? He says, uh, add a plus sign to that. The rest, everything else is uh, top secret. <laughs> it can outrun a missile. It looks like it's going a thousand miles an hour, even when it's standing still. It leaks like a sieve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And until it's up in the air, it'll actually stretch and tighten up. Yeah, they're amazing. They're Is there anything amazing. else you would like to promote? Any websites or any any projects? Um, there's there's no other projects uh, yet. Um, the strike is over and um, um, things are shaping up. I have a let's see, what do I have? I think I have a convention coming up. Yeah, I'll be in January 12th through the 15th in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, there'll be a convention. I do have a Facebook page. My Facebook page, the one I go to the most, it's got a circle, it's got pictures from Cuckoo's Nest on it. And, and, and um, I post every day. I find wonderful uh, uh, feeds. Uh, it, it's, all, it's, it's all good. Well, it's I want good. to thank you once again awesome. for coming on the show. And I wish, want to wish you and your family uh Nothing but the best, and you're always Thank welcome you. to come back on in the future. I'd be, I'd be delighted. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching. I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel for free. You can also like, comment, and follow us. We're going to have a lot of great celebrity interviews coming up, so make sure to click on that notification bell so you can be notified every time we upload a new episode. Also, we ask that you post a link to today's show on all your social media to help spread the word. Thank you, and we shall talk to you soon. Bye-bye.